Hi there. I want to just um, give a few, I share a few ideas to help get the conversation started. And I want to talk about how food is moving in two really big and divergent directions. There's two things happening in food. And the mainstream is that people are moving away from what we'll call conventional food, from established food. I'm going to go back here, sorry. So <laughs> this is what they're moving away from. Um, when I was growing up, sliced bread was this amazing thing, and Wonder Bread was wonder amazing because it was always fresh. Uh, <laughs> and but the, the truth is, people weren't necessarily looking at what was on the inside. And there, if you look at that description of dough conditioner, I, I never had heard that term before, but I can't even, I wouldn't even want to put that on my hair as conditioner. Uh, but anyway, um, what's happened instead is food has moved away from what we'll call conventional food, and it's moving in these two directions. One is the undoing of food. And so the undoing of food is really about the simplification of supply chains, transparency of supply chains, whether that's organic or fair trade um, or just fewer ingredients. And so honest tea, um, which I, th I think many of you had samples of, really, uh, I would say, embodies that. And, and I started honest tea out of my house um, 20 years ago now. And the main idea was to just start with a less sweet tea. I literally was thirsty. I said, I'm, there's, just, there's no drink out there with, without tons of sugar in it. Why isn't anyone making a drink with one or two teaspoons? And so I brewed up five thermoses of tea in my house. I got an empty Snapple ba bottle that we pasted a label on. And I got to the Whole Foods buyer and I said, we want to sell this in your store. And the buyer said, well, all right, we'll, we'll take 15,000 bottles. And I was both this most scary and exciting moment of my life and uh, managed to find a way to make the tea, got into the natural channel and just continued to grow there. Uh, and as we grew, we started to learn more about the supply chain of tea. So we were the first to make organic bottled tea in 1999. And then as we started to you know, re realize that tea is one of the world's cheapest commodities, we realized we could invest back into our communities and inv invest in labor standards and do it in a way that doesn't you know, take us uh, out of the market from a price point. So we launched the first fair trade bottled tea in 2003. And then we just continued to innovate, um, eventually making all of our teas fair trade certified, all of them organic, and bringing out other innovations as well. In about 2011, as you heard, we were bought by the Coca-Cola company. And for us, that was a decision about trying to scale the impact. We knew that if what we were doing was good on a small scale, if we could make it larger but keep the mission intact, make sure the drinks were always organic, always less sweet, then more people, we should try to democratize this. And so one of the most exciting things that just happened in the past few months is that we've launched our Honest Kids drink nationally in McDonald's. So um, now when people go to McDonald's, the, they will have, be able to buy an organic drink priced at the same price point as the other options. Uh, but of course, reaching hundreds, literally hundreds of millions of Americans every year. So it's exciting to see there is this recognition about um, the undoing of food has value and appeal. And so uh, as you heard, at about the time that Honest Tea was scaling, um, and continues to scale, we're launching in Europe, and I spend half of my time with Honest Tea, but there was another part of me that was hungry um, for um, entrepreneurial, a new entrepreneurial venture, but also for a different taste. My family and I have been vegetarian for 13 years, and we have been consistently dissatisfied with the uh, vegetarian or the plant-based options. So uh, I was trying to think about a way to illustrate the lack of uh, effective plant-based options for consumers. And um, you know, the, the, the fact is they face a taste challenge. And I'm going to show you a picture. This was taken in Houston just after Hurricane Harvey. You can see that the shelves were basically cleared out. <laughs> The one shelf that's intact is the vegan shelf. <laughs> that's not an accident. I used to joke that if the meat industry were trying to come up with a strategy to discourage people from being vegetarian, the products on the market would actually be pretty effective because a carnivore eats those once and says, OK, I, you know, I don't need to be a vegetarian that badly. I'm going to choose my juicy, um, indulgent steak or hamburger. And so what we said at Beyond Meat is, well, wait a minute. We're thinking about this the wrong way. They're, they're basically, those are products that satisfy the vegan or vegetarian, or, or not satisfy them, but the vegan or vegetarian will accept. But what if instead we went back and really thought about meat in a different way? And so what we did at Beyond Meat is we started with an MRI of a hamburger. And we said, and we understood it at the, at the, at the, really at the molecular level. We said, okay, well, the, you've got the amino, amino acids that make the proteins, the lipids that form the fats, 70% water, uh, some trace minerals and carbohydrates. All of these components exist in the plant kingdom. And so what we really need to do is be able to find a way to assemble them in a way that replicates the taste and texture of meat. How we can distribute the fats 
alongside the proteins so that they continue to retain their moisture, which continues to um, help deliver the taste. And uh, when you do that right, you get a good product that ends up like this. I will say, and I, I, I apologize, because I tasted the Beyond Burger as I walked in today, and it did not look like this. It was actually uh, overcooked. So I hope you'll get the chance that, that we offered here today. I hope you'll get the chance to either go to Whole Foods or now Kroger and be able to buy um, a fresh Beyond Burger or to go to restaurants like TG. Um, so our products are now carried in the meat section, and that's really what... Um, was for us a huge recognition. We said, okay, if we want to reach the 5%, we'll go to the vegan section. But if we want to reach 95% of people, and that obviously have a much bigger impact, we have to go to the meat section. And it was an interesting conversation with the meat buyers the first time we approached them. They said, well, I don't buy, I don't buy veggie burgers. I don't eat veggie burgers. Why should I take your product? We said, you got to give it a try. And they, they heard the sizzle on the grill. They saw the burger char. And then when they tasted it, they said, okay, and they carried it in. What's exciting now, we're in Safeway and Kroger um, scaling it nationally. And in some of the regions, we're actually the top selling by unit burger, packaged burger. Not just for the vegan products, just in the burger section. So we're seeing acceptance on a much broader level than any vegetarian product um, people have seen. And then, of course, we're also carried in places like TGI Fridays uh, and other chains like BurgerFi. So it's really exciting to see this expansion happen. And, and the goal here is I want to just help think about the impact in a different way. So, um, of course, we're also launching this product, Beyond Sausage. That's now uh, available um, nationally, and, and we're launching that in retail uh, as well. But here's a way to think about the impact. I want to talk about this, uh, what I call a tale of two Henrys. There were two Henrys who lived in the 1800s. Both um, had a huge impact on the quality of life of animals. One was Henry Berg. He was, uh, worked as a diplomat in Russia. And when he was there, he saw how badly the horses were literally worked to death. And he, he knew as a, an American, he couldn't change Russian laws, although maybe today people think about that differently. But uh, um, at that time, he said, I got, he came back to the United States. He created the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals and got past laws to help protect horses and make sure they were watered and rested. Um, so he did a lot to change or improve the life of animals. But there was another Henry who wasn't known as a humanitarian, Henry Ford, uh, by commercializing the combustion engine, literally transferred the term horsepower from the horse to the engine, to the tractor, to the car, to the truck. And in so doing, dramatically changed the way horses lived. And if you were to ask a horse, who did more to help your quality of life? And the horse could answer in a language we could understand. The horse might say, well, Henry Berg had his heart in the right place. But Henry Ford changed the way I live. And I, I will share with you, and you'll hear it, you know, obviously I, I bring a, an activist agenda to my business, but I recognize that when Beyond Meat can succeed by reaching the 95% of people, and we're not going to make everybody vegetarian, and that's not our goal. But if we can get every American family to have one more plant-based meal per week, that would effectively be the same as doubling the amount of vegetarians in the population. So business can play an important and dramatic role in, business, in our diets and in our health when we do it right. And just to underline for us all, why it's so important, this is one of the, my favorite honest tea bottle caps, if we don't change the direction we are headed, we will end up where we are going. Where we are going is the wrong direction. So every five years, the UN ranks the average life expectancy of all the countries in the world. There's about 200 countries in the world. Even though the US is the wealthiest nation in the history of the world, with more knowledge of science and medicine and nutrition than any civilization in history, and even though we spend more on healthcare per capita than any other country, when the UN released their rankings in 2015, Japan was number one, Italy was number two, the United States was number 42. It's shocking, right? It's, you know, so, so I, as an American, I'm incredibly thankful and, and, and proud to be American. There's no country in the world where I could launch this product with five thermoses and an empty Snapple bottle. But this, this shouldn't happen. It's, it's really shameful. At the same time, it's an incredible opportunity for impact. And when people can find, when all of us can find products and create them and, and make them accessible and democratize them to make them available to, to everybody, we have a profound opportunity to change the direction we are headed. And it's not easy work. You'll, we'll engage in the discussion here. This, there are real challenges with the consumer. There's challenging with the established order. Um, but it's work worth doing. And in closing, I'll just share with you my, my favorite Chinese proverb. Those who say it cannot be done should not interrupt the people doing it. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad we're here with a panel of people doing it. Thank you.